we should keep going. Just in case, as, as I say, I think I would overrun just slightly this afternoon. Um, just in case anybody does leave um, early, which is absolutely fine, of course. Just let me remind you. Oops. And just, just let me remind you. And I've, um, you know, some of you arrived at eight o'clock this morning. I'm sorry about that. The start time this morning was nine o'clock, of course. But tomorrow morning, because you're going to do the work tomorrow morning, you need more time to do the work. We are going to start earlier. The scheduled start time tomorrow morning is eight o'clock. We will start at eight o'clock tomorrow. So just in case you're leaving early, I just want to remind you of that tomorrow morning um, is going to be an eight o'clock start, not a nine o'clock start. We'll start off by um, talking a little bit about the structure of the exam and so on. And then um, the next couple of hours practicing together as a group, some back to today. Pericardial disease. So this is the thing that is that, you know, whenever you get involved in echo course, this is the thing nobody wants to talk about. You always give it to the, the new boy. It was given to me when I was a brand new registrar um, many years ago to give a talk about, and um, I've never really shook it off since. So pericardial disease. This is not a disease of the heart. It is a disease of the bag which surrounds the heart. And because it can therefore stop the expansion of the heart, it can have an effect on the function of the heart. So how the pericardium has an effect on the heart is essentially it stops the heart from expanding normally, so filling normally. Um, and um, um, okay, and three things can happen to pericardium. You have an acute pericarditis, excuse me, you have a pericardial effusion, or you can have constrictive pericarditis. So one of these three things can happen. I forgot to put this in. Hippocrates. Hippocrates had wise words to say about the pericardium. Talking about nobody wants to give a talk about it. Hippocrates had wise words to say about the pericardium. This is what he said about the pericardium. He said it's a bag of piss. So I'll try and make it a bit more interesting than that. And if you want to have an image in your mind of what the pericardium looks like, this isn't a bad image. This is, um, you know, a big bag. It's a relatively soft bag. If you pushed on one side of the bag, it would move quite easily and the rest of it would fall over and so on. If you push on both sides, it would gradually give, if you pushed hard, suddenly hard, then it will hold firm. So um, that's a sort of picture of a sort of semi-compliant bag that might be useful to have in your mind. The bag um, surrounds the heart and has got a layer that lies on the on the outside of the heart, another layer separate from that with a gap in the middle. And that, that gap has got some fluid in it. There's typically 50 mils of fluid in it. So everybody's got a pericardial effusion, usually around 50 mils, and it's made from plasma. And um, its job is really to act as, the, as, as, an, as a lubricant, an oil, to allow the heart to move easily and smoothly in the chest as it pumps. You can end up with too much fluid. If you end up with too much fluid, why does that happen? It happens because you make too much fluid, which must mean that you um, um, have either got leaky blood vessels, that's a bad thing, that's cancer, or you've got um, um, a high pressure pushing the, 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 the plasma out of the blood vessels, that's a bad thing, that's heart failure. Or you can't drain it away into the lymphatics. The lymphatics are blocked. That's a bad thing. That's cancer. So generally, things that cause pericardial effusions are usually bad. The one important benign thing that causes sometimes really big pericardial effusions is hypothyroidism. And you can end up with a really big pericardial effusion that can make you really sick. And all that's wrong is you've not got enough thyroxin. So um, that's an important thing to to um, keep in mind. And you can tell from the way I tell that story that I've I've stumbled across that problem in the past in the most embarrassing of ways, as always happens. 
Ok. Acute pericarditis. So this used to, I've sort of stopped it now. When I first wrote this talk, I made it play the good, the bad and the ugly every time we moved on to another, um, another condition, but I've stopped that now because I was a bit childish. So acute pericarditis, this really is nothing. It doesn't really look like this. This is the red filter and a dead body. Um, but to give you the idea that the, the, the pericardium looks red and angry and inflamed, and it's usually a cause of, um, uh, caused by a virus. It can be caused by a number of other things, uremia and so on. It's a clinical diagnosis. You can't make it using echo. And all you can do is um, uh, very occasionally chronic, uh, you know, chronic relapsing pericarditis. You see a bit of pericardial thickening. You don't see it in a true acute pericarditis. You might see a small effusion, um, but nothing else. So echo, in my view, is pretty hopeless. Um, and the reason for requesting it will always be things along the lines, well, it might be a heart attack. Well, you know, if you can't tell a dysphagia pericarditis is a heart attack um, without an echo for every single patient presents that way, then, you know, you need to think a bit harder. Having said all that, um, um, you know, it does, it, <laughs> it does fall within the European guidelines that if there's a concern that there may be a complication of pericard acute pericarditis, you'd have an echo. So maybe I'm just a bit of a, of a stick in the mud but I really don't think it adds much in acute pericarditis. So not much to do there. Pericardial infusion is different. So echo is absolutely the modality to, to identify pericardial infusion. You know, you try and do it with CT, it always overestimates it, always hugely overestimates it, usually because it's done in a non-gated CT. Um, um, so pericardial infusion, echo is really good at identifying the presence of it and the effects of it. What are the effects of pericardial effusion in the heart. So you've got a bag, which is a pericardium, so you've got a fixed volume. Inside you've got the heart. Between the two, you've got fluid. If you pump more fluid in there, what you do is you raise the pressure pushing in in the heart. What does that mean? It means that the lower pressure chambers inside the heart, so the, the chambers with the lowest pressure pushing back out against the, against the fluid, won't be able to push out, they won't be able to expand, they won't be able to fill. And what are the lowest pressure chambers? The right atrium and the right ventricle. So the, the effect of the pericardial infusion will be, first of all, the right atrium and the right ventricle won't be able to fill. The second thing is, forget the pericardial infusion, just think about me for a second. I don't think about pericardial infusion. If I take a breath in, what happens? Well, I take a breath in and um, um, as I breathe in, the chest wall moves out, the pressure inside the chest drops and it sucks air in through my nose because of low pressure inside, the higher pressure outside. So as I breathe in, the mechanism is the chest wall moves out and the pressure inside my thorax drops. That pressure drop inside my thorax, of course, doesn't just pull air in through my nose, it pulls in blood through the blood vessels because the pressure's dropped. When I breathe in, my right heart fills a bit. If my right heart fills a bit and the heart's in a bag, that means the left heart has got less, bit less space left and might fill a bit less. So when I breathe in, me, normal, hopefully me, when I breathe in, my right heart has got a bit more flow. When I breathe out, my left heart, my right heart has got a bit less flow. So we've all got a respiratory variation in flow. And that's not much, though. That's probably 10% or so. If you've got important pericardial effusion that's covering that hemodynamic effect, that becomes hugely magnified because your heart is in a much more fixed volume because all the pressure pushing in it. You breathe in and suck some blood into your right heart. That means as the flow goes up. It's hardly any room for flow to go into the left heart. When you do the opposite, no blood at all goes into the right heart and the blood that's in the lungs from the last pump in, from the right heart into the lungs fills the left heart. So what you see is you see the, the flow goes from high to low to high to low in the right heart as you breathe in and breathe out. So a much bigger variation. So everybody's got a variation, but in the presence of a pericardial effusion, that variation goes up because the heart is in a very fixed 
volume. So you put more in the left heart, less in the right heart, and vice versa. So while my variation hopefully is 10% or less, the pericardial effusion that's got hemodynamic importance, so pericardial tamponade, whatever you want to call it, you see that variation being 40% or more. So a really big variation. So the key things are you can't fill the low-pressure chambers and you get big variations in flow through the right heart and the left heart, but particularly the right heart with respiration. So here's an example of a pericardial effusion, a big echo-free space around the heart. And if you look at the, the right side during ventricular diastole, you should see the right ventricle expand and fill. You don't see that really happening. And during ventricular systole, you should see the, le the, the right atrium expand and fill. And that expansion of the right atrium is very delayed. You can see that there. It's a long time for it to open up and fill. So filling embarrassment of the right heart, you see that again here with the right atrium, it's the same patient. The right heart takes a long, the right atrium takes a long time to fill. And this is an example of um, looking at the E wave as it changes. Inspiration here, it goes down. Expiration there, it goes up. And it, the change is, you know, 50% or more. So um, a big, important change. So the, both these images go with hemodynamically important pericardial Effusion, that is pericardial tamponade. Oh, dear. So I've said all these things. And the other disease of the pericardium that's important is constricted pericarditis. The picture in your mind of constricted pericarditis should be a crisp bag. Um, so the pericardium has stopped being this sort of soft balloon-like thing and it's just become hard and calcified. So that what happens is the heart starts to expand, that's all right, then bang, it hits the crisp bag, it can't expand anymore, it can't get any bigger, and it just stops, stays there, and can't fill anymore. So constricted pericarditis, you get a normal first bit of filling, then bang, suddenly it stops, nothing else can go into the heart. So you get a restrictive filling pattern with a tall E wave that stops suddenly and a tiny E wave. So it looks like the same filling pattern you see um, with advanced uh, diastolic dysfunction, tall E wave, sudden shut off, small A wave. Um, and uh, you've got the same thing again, the heart is in a very small space. So if you breathe in, the volume of blood in the right heart goes up, the volume of blood in the left heart goes down and breathe out, the opposite happens. So you get these big variations in flow again um, with respiration. You can tell two things from this image. One is that the, the pericardium gets really thick. You can see how thick that is. That's, you know, um, a couple of centimetres thick almost. And so that's the first thing you can see. And the second thing you can see is a really bad disease because this guy is clearly dead. Um, um, so, you know, it's a bad disease to have and um, um, it can be very marked. Lots of causes of it. Um, you know, I, the cause that's missing from this list is post um, cardiac surgery. After cardiac surgery, sometimes you get a, a very marked inflammatory reaction in the pericardium that's left, causing pericardial constriction. So, we've said this already, really. Oh, I thought I'd taken these out, these silly. Ah, oh, yeah, it's like a teeth pool, isn't it? Sorry. I've said all these things. So, because of the interdependence, I know it's a TV image, but do you see that flick in the as the septum's relaxing, not now, now. It's got a sort of double flick to it. That's a typical movement that you see with constricted pericarditis. Again, you see the big variation between inspiration and expiration. Um, and um, you see a tall E wave and a small E wave. Exam questions like comparing conditions. That's a thing that happens, particularly in MCQs. 
So, you know, if you're going to compare different kinds of um, um, pericardial disease, comparing pericardial tamponade versus pericardial constriction, um, you know, first of all, it's the presence of fluid, you've got tamponade, with tamponade, you know, you get an effect through the whole of the cardiac cycle. Um, um, so filling is difficult through the whole of diastole, whereas the constriction, the first part, the heart moves freely until bang, it's the size of the crisp walls. And um, 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 the E wave looks relatively normal shape in tamponade, but in, 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 in constriction, you get a tall E wave that cuts off vertically. So you might then be asked, instead of comparing um, pericardial diseases, you might be asked to compare a myocardial disease or pericardial disease, which is constriction with restriction. The only similarities, and that's quite a common question, the only similarities really are the shape of the E and A waves. Um, there's lots of differences. You know, if you've got pericardial disease, um, the the pericardium might not be normal. If you've got myocardial disease, left atrium is big, so you've got high filling pressure in the left atrium. The um, If you've got myocardial disease, the left ventricular ejection fraction or other measures of 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 function you know things like global longitudinal strain s wave and so on are abnormal um so there's there's, there's minor there's minor differences uh, important, sorry, there's important differences and minor similarities um so that has been asked about before comparing myocardial constriction which we'll talk about in a moment to pericardial constriction um um The, there's one thing that I just thought that I hadn't mentioned, I thought I'd better mention was it pericardial constriction? Oh, it's gone. So